Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. It's Sunday, it's the Axon Bulletin, and today I'm joined by Tony Haggerty, Russell Boyce, Laura Bradburn. Welcome to the Sunday Show. Welcome to the Sunday Club. Russell, how are you doing? I notice it's not an Adidas that you're wearing today, which is uh, a turn up for the books. Well, it'd be a letdown, you know, Mondays are for me and Kev, but I know Kev's digging me these days. That, I, <laughs> I have noticed that. I Adidas stuff, so I want to keep my Adidas for Mondays, and I thought, just because I don't want people watching today and thinking, is it Monday? Have I missed a day? And should I be at my work right now? I like that. If I was going to do this, it would have confused people's heads. It's not attention fair. to detail, Russell. It's all about attention to detail. Uh, and on that cool. note, look at the headline. Tony Haggerty, I'll come to you. You're a man of um, many, many words. Mass exodus expected. Will there be a redemption? We all know that Robert Nesta Marley was a Celtic man. Um, <laughs> we know this. We know this. Genius, and, genius headline. I'll take all the credit for it. Yep. So, cause it's, a, it's the kind of thing I would say as he sits swinging in the chair with his Valdunican cardigan uh, but there, there you go yeah, a cracking headline like that I love the, the Bob Marley story I, I remember the first time I ever heard the fact that he was a, a jungle gym was um, <laughs> in Dixie Deansy's book yeah. and Dixie spoke about meeting him backstage in Australia when Dixie was over there at the kind of um, tail end of his career and he met him backstage and he was able to recite the Lisbon line and people thought that uh, it was a joke story simply because Dixie had got the photograph with Bob Marley and then I think a, a hack um, actually was interviewing Rowan Marley for some something completely different um, and he's seen an opportunity to ask him about Celtic and he was like no you know from a young young age uh, my dad taught me all about Celtic and I was watching you wow. know the, the fairly recent documentary it might be about 10 years old uh, the Bob Marley dot is fantastic documentary it's on Netflix and that and I was watching it and it was one of the ones where it was just a cutaway Russell where they just basically looked through the old photograph album and they used some good photos and there's Bob Marley with Rita in the back garden wee Rowan's on his on his shoulder wearing the hoops <laughs> he's wearing the hoops you know I love that. and I remember I tweeting that, that out and it just went mental and um, Rowan Marley came in on the, the Twitter debate and to explain that I was a massive Celtic fan with his old boy which is just tremendous that's class mate that is class that is class and it's, I, it's also old school to actually recite teams it is, isn't it? Depending on what generation, if you've got granddads or great granddads, still folks it to me, they can recite teams at the drop of a hat. And they always do it in groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bonner, uh, Morris Rogan, yeah. Aiken and McCarthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and then they, they go into the midfield. Yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, and, they, and they can give you formations and talk about left halves and inside rights and. Oh, the old fashioned uh, ones. Fashion do, you know do you know why that is, Tony? That is because they watch teams where they actually selected a consistent 11. Like, who's going to be able to name an 11 from this season? <laughs> Correct. You can't even get a goalkeeper, right? I'm going to give you a couple of 11s that might uh, make you fall off your seat in a second, Laura. Um, but I, I mean, what would you? deal with? What would your old man and your granddad Tony, how would they deal with the catrification of <laughs> football? <laughs> the, the data analysis. <laughs> All these terms <laughs> under the data analysis <laughs> that I don't even I, understand. If I... Catrification. It's in your head now. Dream of catrification. The laptop exactly. generation. N nobody speaks like that about football, do they? Apart from well, the the, the niche laptop. I, I mean, I, I think that's the collective term, isn't it? A catastrophication of laptops. Aye, uh, that's the collective term and usage. I, I, I believe, or it, it certainly is now. The yeah. collection of laptops. The big thing about it, I remember um, that day, Tony, that we were invited into the the Celtic press conference, and someone asked David Turnbull about XG rates. <laughs> there was there was a few moments of silence and then he just fessed up and says what are you talking about so um, on the one hand people are saying hey, oh, it's obvious that we don't concentrate on data analysis but then on the other hand when you actually speak to footballers and managers they say you know the less information the better um, when it comes down to actually the game plan make sure they know what they're doing and don't overload them with XG rates it's the catrification of football my father had an expression don't pour four gallon and two gallon heads there you go there you go yeah, I, so, I agree I, like I, I still think you need that on your conscience when you know you're playing football it's meant to be an off the cuff thing you know the moments of inspiration you've ever seen in football from Celtic especially over the years has been moments of magic 
not moments of taking all that nonsense into consideration. It's been <laughs> off the cuff mm-hmm. inspiration and full account of Arsenal didn't need to think about XG rates. They just did it. Well, you know, I, they didn't I, need to worry about 14 clean sheets or something from Brad Fried over a season. You know what I mean? He just uses outside his boot and thinks over his head in front of the away end because he doesn't worry about all that nonsense. Do you know what I mean? And that's how it should still be. Yeah, I th- but I think there's a there's a there's a middle ground there. Like I think if you watch some of the best coaches, like in the NFL and some of the top football coaches, I think there's a place for that for them for putting the plan together. Where where there doesn't need to be that passing on of that information is to the players. That's part of a manager's job is to take all that information, take those stats, take those yeah. things that you put together. And then communicate it to in the players to a way that's simple enough for them to be able to action it out on a football pitch. So, I, like, I think there's a middle ground there somewhere, but certainly, like, I wouldn't be expecting a player to to know in depth about it when you're talking about it. It's very niche, Laura. Let's be honest. It's a niche thing. You know, some people are are you know their flick is swi- switched by yeah, or their switch is flicked by stats and stuff. You know, but. I'm, I'm with Eb Scovdal on statistics former Aberdeen manager sadly no longer with us who said statistics what was it he said statistics are like miniskirts they give you good ideas but they cover up the best things <laughs> <laughs> wow wow that, is, that was a real a real quote that wasn't that was a real translation quote, uh, they, they, they cover up uh, our very, post- very 2021 20, <laughs> 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 when, when was he the Aberdeen manager <laughs> In that the was 90s. Only about 20 years ago, wasn't it? In the 90s. <laughs> yes, yes. It was in the John Barnes era. They, they, they cover up the most important things or something, he said, aye. <laughs> you know, the statistics are like miniskirts. They cover up the most important... Uh, We're getting a few laughs. good ideas. We're getting a few laughs. They cover up the most important here. things. Yeah. But, but, you know, that's just... And you kind of think, yep, there's a... It's very niche. People who like stuff like that will, will like it and will quote it and they'll produce it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying there's not a place for it, but I think when you're talking to f- footballers, you know, you have to be wary of you know, putting a, a big burden on them and making it a more pressurised game. Russell, see, a, lot, a lot of footballers just want to entertain, and that entertainers are off the cuff. You know, you get lots of maverick football players have played for Celtic, and can you try to impart that information to them. I don't think Tony, they would have Tony, do you almost think it's insulting. Do you almost think it's insulting to some of the players that have got literally the gift. They they've got the gift. They know how to play football. It's never been stats that drove them. It's just been the god gift they were given and how they delivered it. Do you almost think when someone tells you something like that, they find it insulting? Well, can you imagine trying to tell something like that to Henrik Larson, as you said? Henrik Larson's no thinking, as you say, Brad Friedel's 14 clean sheets as he's sliding towards him. Uh, he's just doing what comes uh, natural uh, to him, off-the-cuff footballer. So, yeah. The way uh, well, I, um, I ask, you. what I try to do, Russell, if I ever speak to anybody in the game, at any level of the game, I do try and ask them the questions very much like that. How does this actually yeah. work? Can you overload footballers with too much data, etc.? And mm-hmm. I was speaking to Pat Naven last week. I uh, mentioned that before. And Pat uh, still does a bit of work down at Chelsea, etc. And he was talking about the fact that you get this uh, manager often called an elite manager with all the staff around about them. And we'll get on to Eddie Howe's staff in a minute. But the, the, the key, he says, is for the manager to have almost like a filter. So he's got all this different information coming in, be that the figures of a player's performance or their diet or their their training regime. They bring it all in. And, of course, you've also got the opposition analysis as well. Sure. But it brings it all into the manager. And he says the key thing for the manager is to, to ensure that the information that he filters down to his players doesn't create any kind of uh, confliction of what am I doing as as in what Callum McGregor said a couple of times this season, we didn't actually know what we were meant to be doing today, so I think it's a fine, fine balance, but it is modern football and we'll continue to use that term that uh, Paul Tony Jones, and I came up with the other day You're talking about a manager breaking it down and breaking it to players in yeah. layman terms Absolutely, not like Pythagoras theorem No, but that, that's exactly what I was talking about, I think that is the role of a manager, it, mm-hmm. like the physio is not going to tell the player exactly how he's torn the muscle and what the muscle is and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean there's not a place for that knowledge. It's about yeah. giving the relevant knowledge to the but, relevant yeah. person. Yeah. The physio doesn't need to be, know about XG. The player doesn't need to know about muscular stuff. 
the dietitian doesn't need to know about the tactics on the day of the game. It's about filtering the right information yeah. out to the right staff members, and then the manager's role is to bring it all together and put it to the players in a way that they can deliver what they need to deliver on the pitch yeah. on the day. And that's uh, that's it. And, well, I think that's uh, and, because- <laughs> and layman terms, that's what I, is, I mean. Just tell me it so I can understand. That's all it is, isn't it, really? I think, I think it's important what Laura's saying, though, there. I think it's the way the manager then, you know, sort of delegates that information because at the end of the day, you look at a Moussa Dembele, we were fortunate enough to have for two years now. Tony was talking about it on Friday, he gets it. That's a brilliant aspect of the fact he was Celtic. But the flip side was, he played on impulse. He did not play on the XG or the, you know, whatever that nonsense. And I believe that there's certain people that can it takes it away from. Like, it's important how a manager then feeds back that information. Whilst I believe there is, like Laura says, there's a place for it now. We need to all accept it. We need to move on. But I think, I also think you can take away the stardom of someone when you start over-emphasising that stuff. When he put in a penalty that in that, that cup semi, you can't, you can't, no, no stat book is teaching you that. That's magic. That's memories. And for me, that's Celtic. Oh, I love it. Now, we're going to be talking quite a bit about where we are in respect of the communication that has been made to some fans. Some fa- valued fans have had the communication. Others have had to read it online. Um, we're going to be talking also about uh, the the mass exodus, which uh, is expected. And it's a, a really good conversation to have, actually, the, the extent of that exodus and the rebuilding job. Just looking at the personnel, never mind behind the scenes, uh, we're also going to be looking at the situation uh, in and around Eddie Howe and I've got a wee comparison to make um, after the uh, nine in a row um, you know, Rangers team were stopped in their tracks by Vim Janssen, what did they do back then um, in terms of spend, so I'm going to have a wee look at that, it's quite an interesting start to be fair and I don't think we're going to be matching it even 20 odd years later um, we're going to be having a, a wee chat about John Slodden um, the dearly departed John Slodden because I do have a fantastic filmed interview with Sluddy but I wasn't able um, to get it ready because of the platform we use um, the memory in terms of the size of the each file where it can only be five minutes I've got a brilliant video which at some point I will be putting up on the YouTube channel in its entirety uh, when Sluddy spoke to us about his uncle Neely Mocking I'll also be talking about the roadshow that's going to be happening with Dominic Mackay and Peter Lowell. Um, and who is it going out to? And are they actually going to be focusing on the most relevant groups? Because it sounds to me as if they're going to go through the tried and tested groups that, for me, during this pandemic and during the, the downfall of Celtic, many many of these groups have shown themselves up for being uh, unfit for purpose. The Colts next uh, week, apparently we will know all about the Colts um, as a Trojan horse to allow uh, the big team to leave the, the, the league? That's a question I'm going to be asking. There's a wee conspiracy for everybody. Um, and we'll also be looking at the women's team. And I don't know what the XG uh, expected goal rate was today, Russell, but Celtic are beating Motherwell 2 0 at the moment. Uh, this is a very important fixer because we can leapfrog Rangers, who play later on today against Glasgow City, because it's heating up now for not only the league winners, but also that second Champions League spot. Are we allowed to talk about the women? today Russell has that oh, been I don't care what anyone thinks mate about stuff for that if you're going to get petty about that you can vote we're supporting a team for a start right who represents Celtic and I love that passion but the flip side is put all that to one side we're supporting a team managed by a guy wearing a white blazer <laughs> with a red teacher and tracky oh can I just on. say can I just say Russell following the the fine appearance of your own version of that jacket uh, the Axrom team did find uh, an Amiga auction which was looking at uh, TV memorabilia and we have found a white blazer which was used in the Johnny English movie we're winning the auction as it stands our, our maximum bid is 70 quid uh, it's currently standing at £35 I so there's also extra, extra small mate. Oh, I mean, <laughs> Listen, man. it was because it was worn by a waiter who was quite a dinky wee fella in the movie. <laughs> dinky. 
You Honestly, also get a picture, you get a picture of the, a movie <laughs> shot of the waiter wearing said jacket. And there's a I few other... Listen, it. I didn't realise until this morning I got a wee update because it ends on Tuesday and right. I got a wee update. There's a few other costumes as part of the auction. There's some coming in from Planet of the Apes as well. <laughs> so I don't know who wants that if we win it. But I am determined to win it because Russell, obviously... I think, there's, I think there's an outfit from the borrowers going as well. <laughs> 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 we might have to put it to the old dry cleaners before you wear the jacket Russell I hesitate to nickname you Tattoo from Fantasy Island but it's out there now Scrappy too Scrappy <laughs> too absolutely Puppy power. Yeah. Um, The Exodus movement of Ja people there was a bit of wordplay in there but we decided not to use it at the last minute uh, there's a lot of there is a lot of uh, interest in Celtic's main assets I'm not going to go specifically to some of the headlines that we've been seeing who's interested in who but there is supposed interest in Chris Ayer Ryan Christie, Odson Eduard Um, I think Olivier and Cham will have suitors some Celtic fans might remember his performances last season and find that hard to believe but I do think that he, ha- he is a good calibre of footballer he, he does have uh, a lot to offer but maybe just not at Celtic he may be flying the nest other big name players uh, I guess are Albion Ayeti and Vasilis Barkas so the way I'm looking at that is over and above that there's going to be loads of other players leaving the loanees have already started going back to their parent clubs first and foremost Laura Shane Duffy sum up Shane Duffy's Celtic career he's he's now way back down to Brighton he's training with his parent club listen I I, I want to start by saying um, I was talking to my brother about this and uh, we were talking about you know imagine for a split second you got the dream move to your boyhood club you wanted to be a hero in the hoops and uh, it went how it's went for Shane Duffy you would be absolutely heartbroken so I'm sure he is um I think the main problem that I think, having reflected on it, was there's a very different way that you play as a defender if you're playing for, with all due respect, a team like Brighton who are fighting for their relegation at the bottom of the Premier League um, and uh, a, a team like Celtic who are probably majority of the time in possession of the ball attacking that kind of thing it requires a different level of uh, concentration from a, a, a player at the back and uh, and even in the case where um, the ball comes towards the defence and you've got to deal with it, it you know the, the the Brighton team I would imagine in his case especially if they're playing against some of the bigger teams are you know they're happy for it to go into the stand they're happy for it to be headed away in any direction that's not the way that Celtic are expected to play. That's not the way we are expected to play against the calibre of opposition we've got. So there's a double header there where he's been asked to play a slightly different style of football and asked to have a level of concentration that is way above what he probably would have had at any other club. And I think mm-hmm. those two things have meant that, you know, on paper or looking at him for Brighton, you think he's this big, as we've called it, no-nonsense <laughs> defender, but that's not the way that you can play when you're in a Celtic back line and I think that's where where he's maybe struggled. Um, it hasn't worked out. He was never going to stay but, uh, you know, as Jim as Jim Orr would say if he was on with me today, we move on. <laughs> we move on. A couple of comments coming in. Uh, I don't want anybody to think that I'm all about uh, just the free-flowing um, what's it? What's it? Rip roaring, free flowing, never boring Glasgow Celtic. I know that analytics and data is a massive part of football. I just actually don't think that the managerial team or the manager that we had last season embraced it. And I think there was actually a breakdown uh, in terms of maybe what Brennan Rogers had done previously. And I think the um, the term that was used or the quote that I uh, didn't credit Tony for when somebody asked me was that he was an analog manager in a, a digital football age <laughs> and that, that was one of that was one of Tony's um, so some of the comments coming in Kieran McGugan <laughs> Henrik Larson, even only 20 years ago played in a totally different era of football stats and data analysis is embraced by the best in the game now you're 100% right on that Kieran, and I think some of the, the clubs oh, with maybe the point, even don't miss the point don't miss the point with the smaller the budgets good who players, focus on it good. Good players get good stats. Get good players have good XGs and all that nonsense. Good players will always get good numbers. That's the flip side. Honestly, don't, like come on, don't miss the point here. 
No, uh, you're right. And by the way, um, the quote from Ebby Scovdal the late Ebby Scovedale, uh, Stevie Ray, that's why he finished bottom of the league with Aberdeen. Absolutely. Yes. Stevie, yes. yes. And um, I, I, I didn't I, notice again Laura's face, but <laughs> it has been noticed by some of the viewers. I, I was just saying, I was bringing it up just to say that that's how some people view stats. And I was saying, we, we have said on this programme right here now that it's an important part of football. Sure. You can't overload footballers with information. It's about how managers disseminate that information to players it's all down to managers and they need it but it's very niche as Russell says don't miss the point here and to go back to your rip roaring free scoring never boring I wanted to say I don't own the copyright and that I'll tell you where that originated I don't I, I, there was a guy called Jim Cullen who ran the Montrose Bar in Glasgow which was right next to the Daily Record and a few of the boys journalist boys would frequent it every now and again and that became my you know like cheers when Norm walked in and everybody shouted Norm he would shout to me Tony what's the news with the rip roaring free scoring never boring Glasgow Celtic and it was every time and it always made me laugh and it stuck in my head because I started remember it and and he was a larger than life guy uh, Jim Collin a great guy his partner was brilliant I thought he was one of the funniest guys ever and every time I walked in that's what he would shout Tony what's this what's the news of the story with the rip roaring free scoring never boring Glasgow Celtic and uh, and so people are saying get it on t-shirts and stuff so I hope Jim's watching or if, or if someone can get a message to him just tell him it struck a chord with me and that's why I brought it yep. up and the royalties will be on their way to the Montrose <laughs> bar if it's still there um, <laughs> but there's people hashtagging and all that and DMs the rip roaring free scoring never boring and, and, it, and it's, it's hilarious great. I find it I still find it funny to this day it paints a great picture now Studio Riley comes in to say has Tony got a new camera loving it well Tony Tony's actually been in the studio over the last week a couple of times Tony fill the viewers in with who we spoke to the other day because this really is a retro look back that might go over Russell and Laura's head I'm not sure back to the kind of 80s the 70s the 90s and what it was like being a football fan as a kid back then we spoke to none other than Barry Tomlinson, who was the editor of the Roy the Rovers comic, and it was half an hour of absolute bliss on Friday, just reminiscing about uh, myself and Paul John and probably many v- viewers and listeners uh, times reading the Roy the Rovers comic. And uh, yeah, it was tremendous, wasn't it? It was uh, told us a lot of stuff, and that's a podcast that we pre-recorded it, which will be out sometime sometime this week yeah oh, sometime well, Russell Russell listen Roy the Rovers it really just shows you the generational gap because I mean Tony I think stopped buying it in 86 I started buying it in 87 the, he was, was passing the baton there you go <laughs> he was passing the baton over there you go the, this was a, a kind of <laughs> yeah. era though that kids would buy young, maybe a wee bit younger than that would buy the Beano and the Dandy and at Christmas time you'd get Our Willy and the Bruins so comic strips were a thing you know you would buy comics back then um not just as a kid I mean their their kind of target group I think was 8 to 15 now what are 15 year olds reading you know it's, it's incredible so um, Royal Rovers they're, did they're all reading stats Paul they're all reading stats <laughs> 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 the the <laughs> of a generation but you don't get stats you don't get stats comics do you Laura <laughs> <laughs> I don't know maybe you do that but sure <laughs> Barry was a gentleman and but, um, we did we, we waxed lyrical about the good old days of Hot Shot Hamish Roy the Rovers and all of that stuff there's a great picture actually Charlie Nicholas standing next to Roy Race who was obviously a cardboard cutout and Charlie had uh, the Arsenal top and a pair of white jeans so the only thing missing there Russell was the white blazer to go over the Arsenal well, top you know, and I think, Charlie, <laughs> I think Charlie said Roy Race wasn't a legend as well by the way do you know what I mean did he I think he got that in. yeah yeah he's not a real legend Roy Race won three European Cups mate yeah. Uh, he, he, you know, nine league titles, I, I, I eight FA Cups. I, I don't, as long as we're but, all singing to the same spreadsheet, we'll be all well, right. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know what the XGs are 
a fictitious cardboard football player. As long as we're singing yeah. from the same spreadsheet. I didn't miss that. <laughs> well, that was good. That was good. <laughs> That's Sepp Blatter. It is indeed. You're right. Now, um, yeah, so Shane Duffy, you're absolutely right. And I think it's also important to, to state, Laura, that, um, you know, it is one of these things whereby when he came to the club, we were crying out. Uh, on Axon, we were crying out to bring somebody in. Um, who we thought was of that ilk um, and Shane Duffy and you know the podcasts are out there for anybody to look back on and mock us because we were talking about it being a great transfer window at the time and we can't change that that's what we said and obviously it's great now with hindsight to look back and say we got it completely wrong uh, what he went through though Paul I mean in fairness is completely different I mean he lost a parent did he not am I right in saying that was it was something like that there was something he lost his dad there. yes yeah, he lost his dad you know, you you know. Let's be let's be serious here. Do you know what I mean? That rocks people. Rocks people. This guy's in his twenties. In his twenties. Don't forget it. You look at him. You go, Island Cat. I think people think footballers are sometimes are uh, veterans of life. You know, he's still a guy in his twenties, learning his way. You lose your dad. You might sign for the biggest club in the world. You lose your dad. I lost my dad when I was twenty-one. I can relate to it to a point, but I never had to play for Celtic throughout that. Do you know what I mean? I just had to get by day to day. Yep. He came in, you know, I think that gets taken away a lot. I, I remember the same thing with Scott Brown. Like, he went through years ago, written off, all that nonsense. Folk forget to take in what's going on day to day with these people's lives. You know, you don't have the pressure of playing for Celtic on top of that. I That's think Shane Duffy will go on and have a good career still. I believe yep. that. I hope he does. There's no manual or spreadsheet for personal loss when you're a footballer. So... You deal with yep. it. The, you deal with it the way you see fit, and I think that's that's you know that is a byproduct of Shane Duffy's career or season at Celtic, you know, which cannot be overlooked because he he did have to deal with the biggest personal tragedy in his life so oh. far, probably. So, you know, it, when when it comes to analysing it then I think there's a degree of slack that has to be cut and not just the the personal tragedy some of the abuse that he also suffered yep. online I think you have to take that into consideration as well you know this guy's come up from Brighton and maybe not experienced that level of scrutiny either in his, in his life or his private life and not, not just on football matters matters relating to his father passing away and it takes a special kind of person to actually deal with that so I to think do it simultaneously Tony would be ridiculous when you look back yeah, yeah you know, look at it, you go, it would be so, outrageous and I think Shane Duffy himself see that the Celtic season probably a blip in his career because he's a far far better player than this season at Celtic will have shown and hopefully he recovers from a personal loss in some shape or form and then he gets his career kick started again and who knows in the future he might come back at some stage you know maybe have some unfinished business at Celtic because eh, he feels because of the way he feels about the club but I think everybody as a if you see it as a Celtic family will wish him all the best uh, and hopefully he can become the player he wants to be and get back to the forum that he showed that made Celtic so interest him in, in the first place. 100% agree with that. Well said. Good words from Russell as well. Tony, I don't know what you've started here, but we're getting a lot of Roy the Rovers comments coming in. Um, Kaplow Mark, Roy Race, Duncan Gray, Paco yeah. Diaz. Paco Diaz, aye. Yeah. Um, and Martin Bickett reckons we need Rick Stewart as our own goalkeeper. Uh, the way that we spoke to Barry, last word on the matter, he speaks about Roy Race as if he was a real person. <laughs> he actually speaks about him as if he was a human being that he knew um, I mean he edited the comic for 30 years and I actually asked him the question you know was there ever an opportunity to turn it into a film you thought it was so popular at the time they were selling 300,000 comics a week Russell and it's heyday no. 300,000 yeah. a week and um, he says there was a few discussions that just never happened because I always thought Sean Bean would have made a good Roy race yeah I like it I know it, I like that I like that it, it's mad it, though isn't it because it's your imagination just like taking over and nowadays there's just as we've been speaking about all day there's too many stats to prove that Roy, Roy the Rovers doesn't exist really <laughs> if you look on Wikipedia it doesn't actually exist it's not real alright that's, that's a shame 
know, imagine it's a shame. You used to be able to dream. There's you know? an innocence, Russell. There's that an in- that. innocence that's been he, lost. He, 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 hang on, he, can, he, I just, can I just pull this conversation he, back? We're getting a bit too Kevin Graham he, here. We're getting he, a bit too he, on the Delorean. He, he, <laughs> he, he, cannot he, get too Kevin Graham, Laura. There's no <laughs> such thing as too but, Kevin Graham. The, Tony the, has brought the, in this year. Is a forty-year-old magazine. This is the original, one of the original copies when Roy Ray shot. It's iconic. Blood trickling down the letters, right? And five people were in the frame for (laughs) shooting them. And to this day, and I, I named them all to Barry on Friday because I still remember who they were. <laughs> and I, it turned out it was a boy called Elton Blake who was a TV actor, and, and he blamed Roy Race for not landing the part of playing Roy Race in a big TV production. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, mate. The and tension, that see the tension that that created for a for a nine year old. And, and, and for for our generation, it was who shot Jr. For kids, because the year before JR got shot in Dallas, which was a big, massive American soap guy played by ha- Larry Hagman, and Russell and I, uh, sorry, Paul John and I were listening to a pod before it, and I said to Paul, I said, It was our JR moment, and Barry Tomlinson admitted that they stole the idea from who shot JR in Dallas, and they wanted to do a big who done it with Roy Rice. Ah, well, see, when, when, uh, when yeah, Russell and I were kids, there was two. There was Who Shot Mr. Burns and The Simpsons. Yep. And there was <laughs> who, who Shot Phil Mitchell and East Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, there you go, Laura. It's the exact same thing. Yep. So they, 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 they were inspired by Roy the Rovers, Laura. Um, <laughs> when everybody oh, goes God back. Uh, it is. That's another show entirely. I love it when a plan comes together. But we're talking about players going back to their, their parent clubs. Uh, certain players will be leaving. And I had a wee look at the, the squad. There was an in-depth look at this with Colin Watt a few weeks back. And I sent this on a WhatsApp group. Some people responded to it. Um, because they were shocked at the kind of the nature of where we are now. I wrote two potential lineups, and by the way, there's a couple of players in here that might also be leaving. Once everybody leaves the club that we're expecting to leave, and the first one was Bain, Ralston, Taylor, Welsh, Henry, Forrest, Sorrow, McGregor, Johnson, Turnbull, and Ayeti? Question mark. And the second one, so the second uh, choice players would be Hazard, O'Connor. Ball and Golly, Hjeld, Beaton, Sved, Connell, Luca Connell, who's playing at Queen's Park, Henderson, Shaw, who's coming in from Sheffield Wednesday, Rogic, because he wouldn't get a game ahead of Turnbull, and Bio. And I've got a question mark beside Rogic as well, because there's no guarantee that players who have been on the fringes will start or be first picks for Celtic. That shows you, I think, Russell, the, the scale of the rebuild. If that's your first and our so- yeah. second choice, once all the players that we expect to leave, leave the building. Um, and the point was made last week again by Colin, I've got to say, whoever comes in can't buy a, an entire new team. You can't buy... A, who from all the names I've mentioned there would be first picks, do you think? I mean, I, I was looking at it. Maybe Taylor, perhaps, Forrest, Sorrow, McGregor, and Turnbull. There's five. Am I being too harsh? So, no, I, I don't you know. think you're being harsh in the slightest. I, I really don't. I think it's it's one of those things as well, but, but, but it's easy to go... Let's just tell the truth here. A guy plays five games good for Hibs, and we do rate them straight away. A guy plays, like I like Laura mentioned, uh, James Forrest, we brother on Friday. He's played probably two seasons well for Livingston. <laughs> we wouldn't take him seriously as a signing. We wouldn't. The fans wouldn't accept it. Ten get, good game. Hibs are like the fashionable club to buy from. But the flip side is, I can't deny it, would also take all the players that are offered from, from there that we've discussed. Your dogs, your boils. You know, you would, you, uh, and Nisbet, Nisbet up front, fantastic. But the other side is, how are they producing players or signing guys for 50 grand from the, the lower leagues and Celtic aren't? Where are Celtic, like, where is Celtic's youth system coming through? When you look back, some of the mainstays that nine in a row team that you look back on, and it's the nine in a row team now, which breaks my heart even saying it, but it is now the, the nine in a row Mark II team uh, side. Kim Tierney sticks out from that like a sore thumb as the man. Callum McGregor, the man. James Forrest, probably the most derided man that really, when you look back at it, was one of the, you know, he was the man as well. You look at these guys then, they've all came through the ranks. Now, 
we've got to have more faith in what we're producing. We have to. We simply have to. Otherwise, our methods are completely flawed. Now, for all the ranting and raving we do about Brendan Rogers and the projects that he builds, I then can't believe guys like Oakleflex, who he attracted to Celtic because he was Brendan Rogers, mm. aren't yet good enough for that first team, or at least worth, I don't know, their 15 minutes here and there. You look at but, but John Kennedy's method and, you know, Lenny Day will crack me up forevermore because he has stuck. Honestly, I can't believe how, how backwards he's been as a manager. I'm actually a bit disappointed in him for always forward thinking, for always forward talking, for always, you know, contemporary manager sort of patter. Karamuka Dembele is rated as one of the best young players in Europe like yes. was two years ago. He's 17 right now in verge of becoming an Islam Ferris. That's, what we're, that's the reality of where Celtic's got to. You look at Oakleflex, he left Arsenal, I think it was, to join Celtic because mm-hmm. of a project, because of a vision. We're going to lose all of this. We're going to lose it all unless we buck up our ideas and get a manager who believes in that sort of thing again. So, yes, the squad you're looking at, Paul, you're spot on. But I think there's stuff there that if there was still a, a Brendan Rodgers or, let's say, an Eddie Howe in charge that goes, do you know what? He's good. He's good. I can make him good. Like a Luke O'Connell, maybe, Paul. You never know. Even those sort of guys might get in the midfield one day. Controversial. You need need a manager with a vision and with ability to bring out the best in the youth. And we've lacked that the last two years. There's just no two ways. I'm going to come to yourself, Laura, because I, I agree with Russell. I think that we need to do better with the players coming through. I think we've probably lost a hell of a lot of talent over the last three or four years because our focus was just on, it was results driven. It always has to be results driven, but that doesn't, for me, take away the fact that when it comes to a a situation where you've got to throw Stephen Welsh in against Rangers this season, he's only played one first team game at that stage. That's not good enough because Welsh are dominating the domestic game. There are many, many opportunities throughout the season to give a player like Welsh a game. And this is where we really have neglected the youth side of things the the signing side of things I think we've, we've criticised it not just this season but previously as well that policy has to improve we've spoken this week around some of the talent in the Scottish game that would improve our side and it's time for us to stop turning our nose up at that I mean I've used the example and people and I don't mean we should have signed them but I remember when London Dykes the namesake uh, Dykes as I call him was uh, available for just under 2 million quid now he's got down to QPR this season and he's performed well for Scotland as well, I know he's not the type of player um, that Eduard is, he's completely different, Um, 42 appearances, 12 goals, 5 assists for QPR under Mark Warburton, he's playing alongside Stefan Johansson, would he have been any worse than Bio? Because I mean you're talking about the same price range of a player uh, but we go for bio because he, you know that's our signing policy. We try and pick a player from any part of the world. Uh, we bring him in overseas and almost mask the fact that we don't know a great deal about him. We've done the same with Klamala, three and a half million quid coming in for Polish football. Would they have done any any worse than Klamala? Would Dykes have done any worse than Bayern? I'm not saying that, you know I regret not signing him. I'm just using it as an example. You're know, looking at the Scottish market as well, Laura. Is it time for us to really look at some of the players Russell's mentioned? And, you know, it's not a case of us just cherry picking them all because, you know, the club, Hibs in this, you know, in this case, have already had offers in January and knocked them back from English clubs for the likes of Porteous and Nisbet. I mean, we could be in a situation where the minute a Sunderland or any of that, that ilk are interested in a player, mm-hmm. yeah. we're, we're going to get knocked right out of the ballpark when it comes to fees and wages. Why? Well, I, I think I think that's true, but... Um, I, I, there's a bit of an inconsistency when people make this argument about, you know, look how well Lyndon Dykes is doing, look how well Ivan Tony's doing, look how well... My problem is more the fact, would Ivan Tony? There's talk about him going for between 30 and 40 million because of the season he's had. Would Ivan Tony be worth that if he had come to Celtic when he was in Glasgow last summer? Or would he have become a victim of what is apparently a very poorly run club at the moment? and therefore not showing what he has shown this season elsewhere. So I, th- I, I struggle sometimes when people say, oh, look who we were close to getting and look how well they've done elsewhere, because I don't think we can guarantee that they would have done as well coming to us in the first place. Um, 
I, I don't see any reason not to look at the Scottish game because I think there's plenty of young players there that are as good as anything you'll find elsewhere and we can certainly get them cheaper as you said when a, when a team in sometimes even League 1 or 2 are, are, are able to match or, or exceed our wages but I think we do need to have a closer look at what happens to the players that come into the club because I don't think there's a guarantee at the moment that we buy a, a fantastic player and they go on to be a fantastic player for us because there's obviously problems with the coaching and the infrastructure that have caused a lot of much better players to come into the to the club and we've talked about how their level have dropped not long after they've yeah. come in so mm-hmm. um so there's a bit of a 50-50 there for me that I don't I don't necessarily look with nostalgia on what could have been with a player I'm more concerned about what's happened to the players that come in and why have they not lived up to their potential? No yeah. one's look, no one's looking nostalgic like though I really at players. I mean the Ivan Tony thing is the nostalgia, I suppose I agree with you, but I would guarantee you he would do better than Albion I, I would give you that guarantee right now. <laughs> there is no two ways. It has been a disaster <laughs> that guy to, for five to, million pounds. To go back oh, to Lord, even to, you must to, agree. To I go would back to, would do better. To go back to that dreaded word, look at Ivan Tony's stats. Oh <laughs> goal scoring. He would right. come on. He so he's a goal he's a goal scorer. He would have scored goals for Celtic even despite the fact that they were poor. If you you feed the goat and they will score, as they say. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just using Ivan Tony as an example. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not having a goat, you lot either. I'm just sort of saying that I think one thing you could guarantee with Ivan Tony's goals and a good team or a poor team because it's what he brings to the table. It's his specialist skill set to use those yeah. kind of I mean, phrases, you know. Thing, so I actually agree with you, lot on, but. I agree we're with you too. Talking about that. We're talking about this summer going forward, not nostalgia signings. I promise you, like, I don't. I agree you, with you. Sometimes you, you look at shoulda, woulda, couldas, and I agree with you. What's, what's the point? If it's, but, not, it's not happening, but. But you had a, you did, potential signings. You had a chance to shell out five million on Tony, and you shelled out five million on Ajeti. It's no hindsight, it's just factual. If you're looking at two players and you're thinking. And. Aye. There's not, it's not a tinge of nostalgia. You're just looking at facts. One has outperformed the other. And yeah. bearing in mind, he's playing for Brentford. The best he example. hasn't gone to a fashionable club. He's gone to an unfashionable club and he's scored what thirty goal over thirty goals. Is that right? The best example I, I can uh, give to you, Laura, in your defence on this one is uh, I remember speaking to Kenny Dalglish. I, I don't know if anybody's got like a, a kind of book running on when I'm going to name drop somebody that I've spoken to, <laughs> but um, Dalglish on the forty second minute wins, Bob Marley wins a sweepstake. Yeah, Bob Marley. That was his son I spoke to <laughs> <laughs> remotely, and and I did say that to him because obviously. Um, Graham Souness had been in at Celtic training around about the time of the Quality Street kids Tuesday, Thursday nights up at Celtic Park up at Barrafield actually and uh, you know me just naively saying to him what a signing that would have been and Douglas says yeah but you're thinking of the, the Graham Souness that played for Liverpool and to get to that stage he had to have quite a few disappointments in his football career he had to go down to Tottenham Hotspurs and for that not to work Laura then go away and make a name for himself and resurrect his career really at Middlesbrough um, and, he, and he always speaks about Bobby Murdoch being a huge influence in that so you're absolutely spot on in what you say it's not the, the Tony although I, I take what Russell's saying um, into account the Tony what he's done elsewhere wouldn't exactly replicate it at Celtic Park because it was uh, you know a, a really difficult Tony. season um, That's very, Tony will sing for Celtic if you want Sorry, I Tony. This yeah. Tony will sign for Celtic. I'm, I'm. What's the space? <laughs> uh, uh, what, what's the space, Tony? Um, but yeah, <laughs> you don't and specifically similar. replicate the form that you found elsewhere because the the situation at Celtic this season it would have been difficult for anybody to to kind of yeah. Um, perform. Yeah, like I saw, I saw it, uh, uh, an interview with Riyad Mahrez to, uh, last week saying yeah. uh, Saint Mirren rejected him. And everybody's going, oh, imagine if St Mirren had had Riyad Mahrez. Well, maybe if St Mirren had had Riyad Mahrez, he wouldn't have won the league with Leicester and he wouldn't have gone on to be starring in a Champions League final with Man City. It's like, it's all these sliding doors moments. It's the same with when you hear people talking about, oh, Ronaldinho and Zidane nearly signed for Blackburn Rovers. 
Well, maybe if they did, they wouldn't be Ronaldinho and Zidane. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's 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 like it's an argument and a line of thought that I don't always like follow in, in that sense. Here's what I would like you. to ask Ma- Mares if he m- regrets missing out on a Renfrewshire Cup winners medal. <laughs> I'm sure he would. But here's one for you. You mentioned, I mean, the, the mention of Ronaldinho always brings this to my mind, Laura. But um, Celtic sent uh, people on a scouting mission over to Brazil to watch Gremio. Gremio. In the late nineties, and um, you know, at that time there was a young Ronaldinho tearing it up, and we brought home Raphael Shite for five million quid. <laughs> so you know, we could have got Ronaldinho, and and actually he was offered to Saint Mirren as well on yes. trial. Yeah, he was. So whoever that uh, scout mate, was, M- Mares did play for Saint Mirren. He was there for two, uh, two or three months on yeah. loan. Mental, incredible. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, what a grounding. So, um, if we go back to the time where a ten was stopped in Scottish football, previous to this season, what uh, happened at Ibrox is that um, they went and appointed Dick Advocate. And I'm just using this as a comparison, not so that I can talk about Rangers. And Dick, Dick Advocate rebuilt the the, the team. Uh, don't know whose money was used, but he, he rebuilt the team with £35 million of an investment. As I say, I'm not sure where that money came from. Um, in today's money, uh, Russell, it's £54 million. Quid. So in order to prize that championship back from Celtic, they pumped into uh, the team £35 million, pounds, the equivalent of £54 million pound in today's money. Um, we're not going to be in that position, Laura. This is the big. This is a biggie, and I think this is why yeah. the point Colin makes is is a very good point. In that the manager that comes in has to have a bit of the O'Neill about him in terms of and and Rogers rejuvenating players that are already at the club. Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's a lot of players there that uh, are certainly playing below their what they could be playing at if they had the motivation if they had the guidance that they could have look at Callum McGregor I think he's certainly suffering from as he's outrightly said in various points suffering from not getting the right coaching Um, and so there are certainly players there who could be better players than they are currently um, if they were getting the right guidance Um, and, and that and Doing that, getting that right guidance for those players would mean that the signs that you make are more likely to succeed when they come in as well because they would be getting better guidance along with them. But it's still the most important signing of the close season, the manager. Yeah. A good manager or a great manager or a high bar manager will get the best in what's already there and a good manager, a great manager, a high bar manager will bring in good players. That's the signing policy. There's only one signing policy. You sign good footballers, right? Mm. Okay, that that's what happens. Celtic have signed too many poor footballers. No, you have to start signing good and better footballers. It's no hard. And if these guys are you know, dedicated to their craft, then they'll know they're good footballers, like you and I can identify good footballers. I'm not saying it's as easy as that, but it's certainly not as hard as Celtic have made it in the past few years by signing projects and signing poor footballers who don't cut the mustard. Sign good footballers, and then you can start to move forward. Yeah. Tony, would you yes. agree, though, would you agree <laughs> that there's 100% a difference between just... <laughs> like, would you agree that they're like, you need to have a mindset as well, a Celtic state of mind, if you will, you oh, do like need that. to have a wee bit of that. Yeah. I think there's I think there's a lot of good footballers we've signed. That that look at Janino. The guy's won a World Cup. It doesn't Aye. work. Yeah. You need to have something has to change and desire to play for the football club for the first place, I think, has been But I said a good manager will a good manager will bring all these people with him if you're going to sign players. Mm. Right, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I'm on your good, side. But Tony, I'm Tony saying, you're good footballers though isn't enough. We need we need them to how, how, how's it not how's it not enough? enough? How's it not enough? You can't get enough good footballers in your team. It's about how they're coached. But and as I said, the most important sign of the, this close season is going to be the manager. So if it's Eddie Howe, I would put my trust in Eddie Howe to bring in good footballers, make them better, and the team will improve. That's yeah, what I'm, I'm talking about, right? Well. The, but the mentality will be there. It will be but there. To me, that's two different arguments, though, because you're saying don't sign poor footballers. Maybe Patrick Lamella wasn't a poor footballer. Maybe Ajeti wasn't a poor footballer. 
they've come into a club where they aren't getting managed. And so if you get the manager, what? you can make players that might appear currently to be poor footballers better. What have I just said? That's what I've just said. You can make good players better. Do you so think, the ones that are there, that's what I've just said. Do you think, Tony, that uh, this comes in from John McKay, or MCA, coming in uh, via YouTube. Thanks for joining us, John. John thinks that a Yeti under a new manager romps the league. Um, so I think that's one player that I've got on this list with a question mark um, you know I, I agree with you so I think that it's just not happened and it's going to take a massive turnaround um, do you think a player like that and a few others I think McGregor needs a new lease of life uh, hopefully it's at Celtic Park not elsewhere and I hope he gets that with a manager do you think he'll be able to save the career of someone like uh, Al Benayeti no. at Celtic no, or is that uh, is he gone Jim always saying he was at the uh, the walking football, he was back and he was loving it. <laughs> and I said, I'm surprised that yet he wasn't there beside him. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Go ahead, Ted, because that to me is a walking footballer. It's done. That, I, that's, like I think you're being a bit Rodney Marsh there on him, to be yeah, fair. Well, you know well, what I mean? Well, yeah. I every chance. But at the end of the day, see, we're talking about match fitness. And me and Paul John Dykes had this discussion in October last year mm. in the Fable studio, you know? And it was October we had a debate about match fitness. What does it mean? How do you what is what does it even mean anymore? How do you get match fit if you don't play games? How can you only train so much and then get told that you're not match fit because you're not playing matches? Where does it all where does this all balance? How does it even out? For me, I get it. Whilst a good goal record the first six or seven games, let's be honest, no one of you think he's looked up to up to scratch. When he's came on, he's not looked sharp. That's the one. No, he's not. He's not looked sharp. He's not looked sharp. I'm You're sorry. No, no value for money, money for your five million quid. Let's put it that way. Where's his hunger to get that sharpness, so Tony, mate? No, you're no, right. Going yeah, in and doing extra that, sessions. Yeah. And so a good absolutely. manager might instill that in him. That's what I'm talking about as well. You know. Now, uh, so, the Celtic yeah. women are 3-0 up just a wee goal flash for you there the Celtic women's team are 3-0 up we are going to be second in the league after this result and then uh, Rangers play Glasgow City we Laura. are Champions League uh, that would be amazing next season here's a uh, thing somebody popped up there um, saying uh, along the lines of the Raphael Scheidt Ronaldinho um, parallel universe that uh, I brought up earlier Laura that Celtic went to watch Pierce O'Leary playing for Vancouver Whitecaps and there was a wee guy called Peter Beardsley playing for Vancouver Whitecaps <laughs> and uh, we overlooked him and brought in David's uh, younger brother Pierce who played a few games for Celtic but I don't think he was any Beardsley was he really Tony? <laughs> Are you asking Laura or me? I'm asking you, Tony. Pierce O'Leary was certainly not a Peter Beardsley. Peter Beardsley. When I just think of Pierce O'Leary, I think of a penalty over the bar at Easter Road. Yes. And a shootout. Yep. Which Celtic lost. They did. That's, you know how certain players are synonymous with certain things, like Willie Garner synonymous with OGs, Jim Melrose, Vicky to the supporters, Pierce O'Leary, penalty over the bar, and a League Cup tie. After a brilliant, I think it was four each it finished. Ah, it? that's right, aye. And it was, yeah. was that a, a replay as well, I think. Uh, and that's why it's gone to the penalties. Game, yeah. Big Pierce, sorry. Would have taken Beardsley. And certainly not a Beardsley. Yes. Not a Beardsley. <laughs> I'm going to come into the next section and I'm going to come to yourself first, Laura. Um, Celtic's latest communication with the fan base uh, some yeah. valued fans got the communications whilst <laughs> others didn't some season ticket holders didn't get it and some non-season ticket holders did yeah. who did and who didn't who knows um, is this the way for the club to communicate and what did the statement stroke communication actually say um, well I didn't get it uh, my mum did I don't know what the difference is between us because neither of us are, are current season ticket holders but uh, it was she forwarded it on to me to let me have a look at it and I, I was making a few notes on it and I just thought like in summary what it said to me was we've heard you pipe down that was like a long way of saying that but there was a, a couple of interesting comments that were like we're not able to make regular public comment on the matter of of you know, appointing a manager. Okay, mm. you're not allowed to make regular public comment. Some public comment would help, but okay, that's fine. Uh, we plan to have met with all our main supporters groups by next week. What are your main supporters groups? Are you talking about season ticket holders only? Are you talking about supporters clubs? Are you talking about 
um, the only supporters that you appear to have provided any extra value to this season, which is the people paying the most expensive season tickets who are getting hampers and getting audiences with players and whatever. Uh, the other one was our aim as always is to give the supporters uh, uh, our aim as always to give the supporters uh, something they can be proud of based on the great Celtic values. They haven't done anything to reflect the great Celtic values this season, I don't think. And I, I, I've said previously that the whole Celtic values thing is something that, that I do pride myself on or do pride myself as being a Celtic supporter on. But I don't necessarily think it's the club's job to do that. We have the Celtic Foundation who can do that. Don't pretend that you're still like upholding those values and adhering to those values when your actions don't reflect it. Um, and then the last point that I saw was um, bringing up season tickets. Uh, you know, you're going to be getting these out soon, blah, blah, blah. To me, that kind of summed up the whole statement as, and I say this as somebody isn't, who isn't a season ticket holder, but who sympathises with the season ticket holders in this case. Um, it sounded to me that the fact that they were saying, oh, by the way, we are going to tell you about season tickets soon. It's as if they've said, listen... You're not getting any more information before the season tickets come out. You're not getting any more communication before the season tickets come out. And by the way, we know that you have plans to make and blah, blah, blah. They're, they're acting as if the season ticket holders have got 600 quid just to drop within a matter of weeks to, to re renew their season ticket. And that's just not the case. If they were following the Celtic values that you talk about, they would know that that's not the case for a lot of the supporters. But um, yeah, I, I just thought it was a very long-winded kind of extravagant way of saying not very much. <laughs> My kind of view on the communique, because I agree with you, um, is that uh, for me, they were focusing on, the f you know, we are not able to um, make regular public comments on this matter. And what they're referring to is the specific man matter of the manager. Mm -hmm. But I don't think... All season, that's what the Celtic supporters, and certainly on a Celtic state of mind, that's not what we've been asking for. We've been asking for regular engagement, regular communications, not specifically just the manager. Yeah, that has obviously been over the last 70 days, something that's been in focus. But I, I hope they're, they're not missing the point here in terms of why we are constantly going on about the lack of engagement. It isn't just because of the manager. It's just the, the communication this season has been absolutely dreadful. From the club, and actually, I would include that statement in it. I don't think yeah. it's getting, got any better. Uh, as I say, I mean the consistency: who got it, who didn't, who's in, who isn't. Um, are was it meant to just be season ticket holders? Because if if it was, then you're going to have to have a look at your mailing system that you've got. Was it sent to people because they had bought online tickets or something from the shop at some point? Who knows? Um, but in relation to the communication, I think that uh, there's a wee oversight there. But I agree also, Laura, with regards to uh, the main supporter groups because I feel that some supporter groups that have been in uh, and around the club for many, many years, decades, generations have been silent all season. And so why are they going to get an audience with Dominic Mackay and Peter Lowell? Why not come to um, a platform such as, and I'm going to use it as a shameless plug, like this one, and speak to a vastly greater audience than uh, the people who obviously um, haven't stood up to the club all season uh, because they don't want to upset anyone because once everybody gets back, they want to have the free seats in the boardroom. So... For me, it's not the way to go. I am not impressed with the fact that, and it's not just me throwing the toys at the pram because Axom haven't been invited to any of these uh, clandestine meetings, but um, I think that you're out of touch, guys, if that's what you think the way to go is. Russell, what's your thoughts? Um, I felt with the, the, the email, I got the email. I've never, I'll tell, like, let's just come clean. I've never gone to <laughs> seven season tick in my life. I've got Saturdays my whole adult, adulthood. So for watching right now, if I've b spoiled your myth, I don't care. <laughs> like, I've never had one, right? I've been to as many Celtic games as I could grow up. I loved it. Always have loved it. But the fact of the matter is, what got in the way? I own my own pub. You know what I mean? Saturdays are important. That's it. I work for a company right now where Saturdays are part of my rota, so I won't be buying one next season either. I got the email. The thing I thought with the email, though, and the important side of it, is I don't think it matters what they wrote unless they were appointing the manager. We were all going to slate them for it anyway. And I do feel there's an impasse here where the club's created this, by the way. That's the problem now. And you can almost 
it's got to a stage you can almost now see it from the club's point of view. You can almost go, do you know what? Whatever you post, we're going to hammer you now. You know what I mean? <laughs> we are coming for you with knives, unless it's a point in the manager. But if you go a wee bit further back, you go, this actually still is a club creating thing. Do you know what I mean? Like it was there, like you created the distance, and now I do accept that it's going to get petty. And it doesn't matter what you say, we're going to go, you know, all they said was we're looking at a manager, so we're going to like still hate you. Like I get all that nonsense. The flip side is it's been 80 days. And the flip side is it had been three months before that you sacked Lennon that we'd all been asking for some sort of communication. There were sharks outside the, the, the ground, you know? <laughs> all this nonsense has been created by Celtic. But Man. I do have to accept that if you take all that away, I don't know what people expected from the email if they went to uh, appoint a manager. What did you want them to say? Oh, there is oh, nothing to say at the end of the day. Like, what? It was always a hiding to nothing to me. <laughs> What I took from that is I want to see Laura wear a T-shirt. I've heard you pipe down. <laughs> <laughs> that, sh- that should be Laura's personal motto. <laughs> <Aye>. <laughs> I know. Because nobody's going to mess with you, Laura, when you're in that mood. You know what I mean? in, that, in, that, in that mode, it's brilliant. I love it. It's great. Um, and I agree with what you said completely. Yeah, but you know, that's, that's your motto now. I've heard you pipe down. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, I, 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 I like that... I would ex- I would come on here and say if I thought there was anything of substance in there that they yeah. that they communicated to us that that we didn't know previously. Yeah, everybody the- knows that Dom McKay's in the middle of a handover period. They didn't need to spell that out for us. Everybody knows that the reason they've not announced a manager is because they're trying to give us the highest quality manager that they can. This is all stuff that we know. Like yeah. Russell says, anything that you told us that wasn't here's our new manager. Is is pretty pretty pointless at the moment. It is, and by the way, that's that's a quick that's a quick hour. But before we go, a couple of wee things to update you on. First and foremost, Celtic are still winning three nothing against Motherwell. We're sixty five minutes in. Uh, Tegan Bowie just came on. She's another player I rate highly. Having started watching the Celtic women's team, Russell, because I support Celtic, so it could be the women's team, it could be the first team, and it could be the Colts team next season. Hopefully, Celtic, um, Celtic ball, you know. That's it, exactly. The green and white hoops. I'll be watching them. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention is. Uh, a week ago I think it was um, I did ask everybody to keep John Slodden in their thoughts and their prayers uh, because he was fighting a very difficult battle unfortunately you lost that battle you will have seen some of the messages coming through on Twitter and he's one of the guys and I don't mean to sound cliched but you know everybody loved John Slodden, everybody loved Slodden, anyone that came into contact with him um, you know and he spoke brilliantly about the likes of Tommy Burns who uh, was a good pal of his uh, his uncle Neely, Neely Mockin he was just steeped in Celtic traditions, he's one of these guys that um, you know had things gone a wee bit different in his own career, he might have played more than the one game that he did play for the first team in the Glasgow Cup Tony Haggerty, you were looking at that and his um, incredible performance for the Scottish schoolboys back in 1980, where he scored 2 in the 5-4 game as well yeah, and I'd said it on Friday, and I said to Laura as well, just go on to YouTube and watch that England-Scotland schoolboys game from 1980. 5-4 to Scotland, Sluddy getting two, front of 70,000 at Wembley, Brian Moore commentating, Serene, uh, Ian St John summarising. It's just a snapshot of time, but it's it's fantastic. And yeah, and that's a fitting tribute if you want to remember John Sludden as a footballer, but I remember him as a person as well. I shared the press box with him on many occasions and echo what you said there, Paul. He, you couldn't not love him. He was a, a lovely guy, very humble yep. and uh, very kind and a decent fella. So my thoughts and condolences to the family. Absolutely, to the Sluddens and the Mockins and everybody else who knew and loved John Sludden. And, you know, when I I hear stories like that, uh, I think back to the time he came through to speak to a Celtic state of mind. I retweeted that the other day there. Uh, Anybody who wants to catch up with uh, John Sludden's football career, give it a listen. It was fascinating. You know, I I asked him, he was Islam Farouzi's coach at Celtic, John Sludden. Uh, And he spoke about his disappointment as to how Islam's career worked out and I did ask him who was the the, the, the most promising player he worked with when he was coaching up at uh, Lennox Town. You know what he said? Simon Ferry. 
Cy Ferry because I think Simon Ferry had some really really bad injuries at a young age right. um, and that curtailed his career somewhat but uh, also Sloddy was a big friend of Brian McLaughlin the original super who played with Celtic made his debut at 16 as well and they moved into the junior game together so um, all the best to everybody that knew and loved John Sludden and that is the end for a Sunday bulletin where we threw quite a lot into the mix today we don't always agree uh, but that's what it's all about thank you to Tony Hanger to Russell Boyce and Laura Bradburn and thanks for all the commenters everybody that's getting involved in the social media for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind 